Outside, long and white, the road twists like a snake toward the far off blue places, toward the bright edges of the earth. It burns in the sunlight, a dusty stripe between the wheat's dull gold on one side and the shimmering red hills and gray green scrub on the other. In the distance, prosperous farms, ruined mud walls, a few huts. Everything seems asleep, stricken by the heat of day. A chanting comes up from the plain, a sound long as the unsheltered road, or as poverty without the hope of change tomorrow, or as weeping that goes unheard. The Kabyle farmers are singing as they work. The pale wheat, the brown barley, lie piled on the earth's flanks, and the earth herself lies back, exhausted by her labor pains. But all the warm gold spread out in the sunlight causes no glimmer of interest in the uncertain eyes of the wayfarer. His locks are gray as if covered by the same dull dust that cushions the impact of his bare feet on the earth. He is tall and emaciated with a sharp profile that juts out from beneath his ragged turban. His gray beard is untended, his eyes cloudy, his lips cracked open by thirst. When he comes to a farm or a hut, he stops and pounds the earth with his long staff of wild olive wood. His raucous voice breaks the silence of the countryside as he asks for Allah's bread. And he is right, the sad-faced wanderer. The sacred bread he demands without begging for it is his by right, and the giving of it only a feeble compensation, a recognizing of the injustice that is in the world. The wayfarer has no home or family. He goes where he pleases, and his somber gaze encompasses all the vast African landscape, and he leaves the milestones behind one after the other as he goes. When the heat is too great and he has had enough walking, he lies down under the big pistachio tree on the side hill or at the foot of a weeping 
eucalyptus beside the road. There, in the shade, he drops into a dreamless sleep. It may be that at one time it was painful for him to be homeless, to possess nothing, and doubtless also to have to ask for that which his instinct told him was due him in any case. But now, after so many years, each like the last, he has no more desires. He merely undergoes life indifferent to it. Often, the gendarmes have arrested him and thrown him into prison, but he has never been able to understand, nor has anyone explained to him how a man can be prohibited from walking in the life-giving light of day, or why those very men who had failed to give him bread or shelter should then tell him that it was forbidden not to possess these things. When they accused him of being a vagabond, always he said the same thing. I haven't stolen. I've done nothing wrong. But they claimed that was not enough and they would not listen to him. This struck him as unjust, like the signposts along the highways that illiterates had to understand. The tall, straight back grew bent, and his gait became uncertain. Old age arrived early to exact its payments for his shattered health. He suffered from the wretched illnesses of old age, those ailments whose very cure brings no consolation to the patient, and one day he fell beside the road. Some pious Muslims found him there and carried him to a hospital. He said nothing. But there the old man of the wide horizons could not bear the white walls, the lack of space, and that spongy bed did not feel as good as the ground he was used to. He grew depressed and longed for the open road. If he stayed there, he felt, he would merely die, without even the solace of familiar sights around him. They handed him back his ragged clothes with disgust. He was not able to go very far, and he collapsed before he got out of the city. A policeman came up to him and offered to help him. The old man cried, If you're a Muslim, leave me alone. I want to die outside. Outside! Leave me alone. The policeman, with the respect of those of his religion for the penniless and the deranged, went away. The wayfarer dragged himself beyond the hostile city and fell asleep on the soft ground beside a faintly trickling stream. Covered by the friendly dark and with the vast emptiness around him, he fell into an untroubled sleep. Later, he felt stronger and he began to walk straight ahead across the fields and through the scrub. The night was drawing to an end. A pale glow came up behind the black line of the mountains of Kabylia. And from the farms, the cocks cracked voices called for daylight. He had slept on an embankment which the first rains of autumn had covered with grass. The cyclamen-scented breeze brought with it a penetrating chill. He was weak. A great weariness weighted his arms and legs. 
but the cough that had come with the arrival of the cold air now bothered him less. It was daylight from behind the mountains shone a red dawn, making bloody streaks on the calm surface of the sea and dyeing the water with golden splotches. The faint mist that still hung above the ravines of Mustafa disappeared and the countryside came nearer, huge, soft, serene. No broken lines, no clash of color. One would have said that the earth, lying back in exhaustion, still permitted itself a sad and slightly sensual smile, and the wayfarer's arms and legs grew heavier. He thought of nothing, no desires, no regrets. Softly in the solitude of the open spaces, the uncomplicated and yet mysterious force that had animated him for so many years fell asleep inside him. No prayers, no medicines, merely the ineffable happiness of dying. The first tepid rays of sunlight filtering through damp veils of eucalyptus leaves gilded the motionless profile, the closed eyes, the hanging rags, the dusty bare feet, and the long olive wood staff, everything that the wayfarer had been. The soul no one suspected him of possessing had been exhaled, a murmur of resignation from ancient Islam in simple harmony with the melancholy of life. Thank you.